When you think of the biggest Hollywood blockbusters that have come out since the year 2000, I bet you've got some Christopher Nolan movies in there. Movies like Memento, Batman Begins, The Prestige, The Dark Knight, Inception, The Dark Knight Rises, and Interstellar. Collectively, those movies raked in about $1.7 billion at the box office, billion with a B. And that doesn't even include movies that he helped write but didn't direct, like Man of Steel, which was directed by Zack Snyder. On July 21st, Christopher Nolan's latest blockbuster is being unleashed. If you're listening to this episode when it's released, you obviously know that date has not happened yet, so there's no way to know how many more hundreds of millions of dollars that will add to the impressive list of films that we just mentioned. Thanks in no small part to the success of his previous films, Christopher Nolan has been able to command a big salary for his latest big-budget film. The largest, in fact, since Peter Jackson's deal for King Kong back in 2005. For his work on Dunkirk, Christopher Nolan earned $20 million, plus 20% of the box office gross. If Dunkirk makes anything near the $188 million that his last film, Interstellar, made at the box office, that would mean Christopher could tack on another $37 million or so on top of that $20 million base salary. Not too bad. That's just a little fun fact to keep in mind as you pre-order your ticket. And now that you know a small percentage of your theater ticket will be going to Christopher Nolan, and with a few weeks until the movie itself is out, let's take some time to learn the true story. That way, when you do see the film, you'll be able to judge for yourself what's true and what isn't. I'm Dan LeFebvre. And this is based on a true story. It's time now for Two Truths and a Lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode, and then, by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to know which one was a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end to see how well you did. Okay, here they are. Number one. Allied commanders didn't think they'd be able to get more than 50,000 people evacuated. Number two, with Allied troops surrounded, Hitler ordered a halt on the Panzer Group's advance. Number three, the evacuation at Dunkirk was only possible because of a massive Allied counteroffensive that pushed the Germans back through France. Before we get back to the show, I want to let you know you can recommend a movie you want to see covered on the podcast over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash recommend. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash recommend to recommend an episode for the feature. And with that, let's learn the true story behind Dunkirk. Our story begins on May 10th, 1940, a Friday. For many Americans, it's a Friday like any other. Looking through the lens of history, this particular Friday was one that many consider to be the true start of the war in Europe. Ever since the official start of the war on September 1st, 1939, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain has been trying to end the German aggression through economic means instead of meeting it head on with troops. Of course, that's not to say troops weren't involved. In April of 1940, the Allies approved Plan R4. Since Germany didn't have any native source of iron, they'd sourced a bunch of it from France in anticipation of the war. But when that started to dry up as 1940 rolled around, a new source had emerged. About 80% of the iron that Germany needed for the steel that fed their military machine passed through Narvik, Norway. Technically, Norway was a neutral country. So this new idea was to mine waters off of the Norwegian coast and block German supply ships with those mines while simultaneously making it accessible only for British forces. We'll never know if the plan would work because this plan turned out to be an abysmal failure. Certainly knowing how important Norway's iron was to the war effort, Germany invaded before the plan could be pulled off. But their offensive didn't end there. You see, before the sun had even begun to rose on Friday, May 10th, Hitler uttered a single word into the radio. Danzig. With that word, 
the Nazi military was given the go-ahead on an offensive known as Operation Fallgelb. With the new offensives from Germany, it was clear Chamberlain's method of strangling Germany's economy wasn't going to be enough. Losing significant amounts of support from the people over his failed attempts at handling German aggression, that very same day, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain tendered his resignation after the failure of the plan in Norway. In his place, a new Prime Minister took over, Winston Churchill. And it was on this Friday, May 10th, 1940, that most historians consider to be the end of something referred to as the Phony War, the period when many countries were technically at war, but there wasn't much military action. That changed with Operation Fallgelb. The countries in the Nazi crosshairs on this new Western offensive were the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and their neighboring ally, France. Leopold III, the King of Belgium, had pleaded with the Allies to send forces to help save his country. They did, but it wasn't enough. This new offensive wasn't like anything the world had seen before. Oh, sure, the idea of a swift offensive wasn't new. After all, the Germans had tested out these same capabilities on Poland in 1939. But this time it was different. There was no warning. The invasion began with a devastating bombardment. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe had timed things so perfectly that as soon as the bombardment was over, the defending forces didn't have any time to recover from the explosions before they were descended upon by paratroopers. Then immediately after this came massive amounts of soldiers and machinery. The result was stunning. Defending troops were chaotic and disorganized at best. At worst, they were overrun without any sort of a fight. This sort of offensive strategy was one that made the world fear the Nazi military machine. Today, we know of it by a German term, Blitzkrieg, meaning lightning war. Although technically that's a term the Allied media came up with as they were trying to describe what was happening as Germany marched into four different countries virtually unopposed through Belgium and into France. As they did, the defending forces were pushed back deeper and deeper through Belgium and into the French countryside until about only two weeks after the attack began, there was no more countryside left. That's when the troops found themselves backed up against the English Channel on the beaches near a small town in France called Dunkirk. The troops were from the countries the Germans had invaded, Belgium, France, and the Netherlands. But there were other troops from the Allies, Poland, Canada, and the United Kingdom. In all, 400,000 men now found themselves stuck between an impassable body of water and an advancing force of twice their size. Not only were they outnumbered, but they had just witnessed the terrifying blitzkrieg of the Nazi forces. Their bodies were battered and their morale was broken. But they had no choice. Without ships, they couldn't cross the English Channel. Without rest or much of a morale, it seemed only a matter of time before the beaches would become their final resting place. Backing up for a while, let's learn what was going on across the channel where a newly appointed Winston Churchill had to hit the ground running. Three days after becoming Prime Minister, Winston Churchill tried to muster support from the House of Commons in a speech that's now referred to as the Blood, Toil, Tears, and Sweat speech. In that speech, he showed off his brilliant talents as a speaker as he spoke with brutal honesty, saying, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. After giving this speech, Winston Churchill will tell his chief military assistant, General Hastings Ismay, Poor people, poor people, they trust me, and I can give them nothing but disaster for quite a long time. And everyone knew perhaps the first disaster might have been just around the corner, or more accurately, across the channel. Those words were spoken on May 13, 1940, and just the day before, the Germans had started launching their Blitzkrieg on the main French defenses in Sedan, which is a small city on the northeastern border of France, about six miles from Belgium. That's about 10 kilometers. Three days after the assault began, Sedan fell. With it, the Germans 
head away around the Maginot Line. That's a defensive line built in the 1930s along the French border with the intent of keeping German forces out of France. Instead, after only three days of fighting, the Germans just went around the Maginot Line instead of going through it. Once that happened, Winston Churchill knew it was only a matter of time before the whole of France fell. And so, on May 15th, as Sedan fell, Churchill also knew this was just the beginning of the war. If the Allies were to have any hope of fighting back against the Germans, they couldn't afford to lose the 400 men making their retreat across France as they were being chased by a German force. On May 20th, the main bulk of the German tanks and mechanized forces had cut off the Allied southern escape as they positioned themselves along the English Channel at noyel sur That's about 65 miles or 100 kilometers to the southwest of Dunkirk. After a vicious few days, the Germans had managed to do something in less than two weeks that they couldn't do in four years during World War I. Reach the Channel's coast. It was a morale boost for the Germans, many of whom, as we now know, had been able to postpone sleep for the duration of the offensive push thanks to methamphetamine use. This also meant the hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers on the beaches near Dunkirk were effectively surrounded, held by the ground forces and easy targets for the German Luftwaffe that had been slaughtering anyone in their way since the offensive began. Then something incredible happened. As the Allied forces were bottled up on the beaches, Field Marshal von Kluge and someone who had just recently been promoted to Field Marshal during the French offensive, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, issued an order sanctioned by Hitler to halt their advance. It was an order that started to go into effect on May 24th. The real reason for this halt is something that many historians still debate today. After a successful push through France, the Germans could have finished off their victorious offensive push and dealt a devastating blow to the British at the same time. If they had, the outcome of the entire war might have been quite different. The rationale for this halt, according to von Kluge and von Rundstedt, was because of something that they both remembered well from when they fought in the First World War. After an impressive offensive push, the Germans had made their way through Belgium and northeastern France. The results were very similar to what was happening in 1940, except in September of 1914, a vicious counteroffensive had halted their attack near the Marne River. If you're not familiar with the French geography, that's near Champagne, or about 85 miles, or 140 kilometers, east of Paris. This same sort of counteroffensive is what they were trying to avoid now that they'd managed to back up the bulk of the resisting Allied forces left in France to the beaches. It was also a chance for the German troops to catch their breath and get some rest. The German Army's Chief of Staff, Field Marshal von Braustisch, tried to repeal the order, but Hitler refused. He sided with von Kluge and von Rudstedt and instead decided that Really, something we really don't know why. Maybe it's true. Maybe they just didn't want history to repeat themselves. Or maybe it was something else. Hitler himself would later say that it was because of the rain, with natural marshes near the town of Flanders, just to the south of Dunkirk, rains would have made it nearly impossible for tanks to move. Or maybe it was something else. Years later, One of Hitler's last statements before taking his own life in 1945 was to explain his decision. He would change what he had said before about Flanders and say that he halted his forces in hopes of getting the new British prime minister to come to some sort of peaceful agreement with Nazi Germany. The truth is, we simply don't know the real reason. What we do know is that Hitler's decision to halt the advance was one that helped ensure something miraculous. On May 26, 1940, Operation Dynamo went into effect. The idea was, quite simply, to get as many of the Allied forces off the beaches at Dunkirk as they could. To make matters worse, the beach at Dunkirk was too shallow to let large boats get anywhere near the land. And of course, those smaller boats couldn't make it across the channel very well, so that meant that they'd need to have smaller boats 
take men out to the larger boats who can then take the men to safety. It might sound like a simple plan in theory, but it's easier said than done when you have 400,000 troops surrounded by the enemy and still within range of the brutal Luftwaffe. Not to mention the fact that the Allies had no idea why the deadly panzer divisions were sitting and just waiting a few miles away. For all they knew, it was only a matter of time before the order came from Hitler to advance and finish them off. Most of the military high command for the British believed that they might be able to get between 40 and 50,000 people off the beaches, and they'd be lucky if they got that many. Even though it was a military operation, Dynamo involved much more than the military. As the operation began, King George VI of Great Britain called for a national day of prayer across the entire country, something that helped alert the public to the dire situation in France for the first time. Meanwhile, at 7 o'clock p.m. on May 26th, Churchill officially gave the order to begin Operation Dynamo. Although it's not like people waited until the official order was given, evacuations had actually already begun. The official order just intensified the operation. All of the movement didn't go unnoticed by the Germans. Even before Churchill officially began Operation Dynamo at 2.30 p.m. on May 26th, Hitler reversed his halt order and instead ordered the panzers to continue their advance. He also ordered the Luftwaffe to pin down the Allied soldiers, stopping their escape until the panzers could arrive. Those panzers, by the way, weren't necessarily expecting the order to continue the advance right away. So it took a full 16 hours after Hitler's order on May 26th, before they began rolling again. The first full day of the evacuation was May 27th, and initially there were about 35 ships involved. A call for help was put out, and civilians responded. Hundreds of small leisure and fishing boats were put to use. While there have been some conflicting reports about the exact number of boats used, most estimates are somewhere between 650 and 800 civilian ships. On the military side, we have more accurate numbers. 220 military ships were used throughout the course of the evacuation. In an event that many religious people throughout the decades have called Providence, or if you're not religious, maybe it was just luck, but rescue ships weren't the only thing that arrived in Dunkirk during the beginning stages of the evacuation. Sudden storms and heavy rains slowed the Panzer advance while keeping the Luftwaffe out of the skies for extended periods, but not permanently. As the ferrying continued, the storm subsided. Then the Royal Air Force got involved and tried to combat the Luftwaffe. On May 27th, the RAF managed 38 kills compared to only 14 losses. Still, the Luftwaffe had managed to do extensive damage to the troops without any form of cover on the beaches. Thousands died. From their perspective, most of the troops had no idea the RAF was even involved because in the chaos, all they saw were bombers just that brought death and destruction to them. There's many reports of British soldiers bitterly cursing the RAF for not being there to help. But they were. In fact, for the week of the evacuation, the RAF flew over 3,500 sorties to support Operation Dynamo. On May 28th, the evacuations continued amidst rumors of another kick to the morale. The King of Belgium had issued a full and unconditional surrender. That meant the Belgian army at Dunkirk also surrendered. This left a huge opening for the forces trying to defend the beaches, and British troops filled their place. Remember the initial estimates at the time of the Allied High Command, hoping to be able to evacuate between forty and 50,000? Some men had been evacuated before Operation Dynamo officially began, but on the first day, May 27th, 7,669 troops landed in England from Dunkirk. May 28th, an additional 17,804 troops had been rescued. The next day, 43,310 troops. On May 30th, 53,825 troops in one day. And then that was broken on May 31st, 68,014 more. 64,429 were rescued on June 1st. The operation continued on June 2nd and 26,256 were rescued. Then on the 3rd, an additional 26,000 
746 troops were rescued. On the final day of evacuations, June 4, 1940, 26,175 men were pulled from the beaches to safety across the English Channel. In all, 338,226 men were evacuated from the beaches at Dunkirk before, on June 4th, the remaining 40,000 troops were forced to surrender. That same day, June 4th, Churchill again addressed the British House of Commons. It was a speech that would go down in history as one of the greatest speeches of all time. But it was also a long speech, so I won't include it here word for word. To give the spirit of the speech, though, Churchill began by explaining that he had scheduled the speech a week before, and at that time, he thought that he would have to explain the greatest military disaster in the history of the British Empire because he knew what was about to happen on the beaches of Dunkirk. After all, in his first speech to the British people as their new prime minister on May 19th, news had just spread that the Germans had broken through the Sedan So he thought it was only a matter of time before all those troops would be lost. Churchill went on to explain, though, that despite tough weather, a hailstorm of bombs, and intensely concentrated artillery fire, not to mention mines and torpedoes that were in the channel, that the valor of the men who were involved in the rescue shone through. As a result of that valor, over 335,000 French and British soldiers were clutched from the jaws of death and shame as they made their way back to England. Sadly, over 30,000 perished during the evacuations. Still, Churchill was very careful to explain that wars are not won through evacuations. Despite this massive victory, it's not going to be the end of the war. The war has just begun. If you want to hear the actual speech, I'll make sure to put a link to that where you can listen to it in the show notes over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. As Churchill alluded to, many lost their lives. Not only that, but sorely needed equipment and supplies were lost as well. In fact, since the beginning of the German offensive onslaught on May 10th, throughout the duration of their retreat, the British had been forced to leave behind almost 100,000 vehicles and motorcycles over 416 tons of stores and nearly 100,000 tons of ammunition, not to mention over 160,000 tons of fuel. And that's also not mentioning 445 tanks that were forced to be abandoned along the way. Not only was all of this abandoned, but you can bet that the ammunition, fuel, and other equipment was repurposed by the Germans. During the evacuation, 18 ships were sunk by constant bombing from the Luftwaffe, most notably nine destroyers, six British and three French. Another 19 destroyers were damaged, and well over 200 civilian ships were sunk. In the air, the RAF lost a very precious 145 aircraft while taking down 156 Luftwaffe airplanes. Despite all of these losses, the evacuation at Dunkirk was a decided victory for the Allies, Historians have surmised that the amazing number of men rescued was due in no small part to the heroic effort of those Allied forces involved in the evacuation. But it was also because of the halt order given by Hitler. The miracle at Dunkirk, as it would become known, was something that many considered to be a pivotal turning point for the Allies during the war. Seemingly supporting this was something written by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt in his memoirs after the war was over. If you remember, he was the one or one of the men who had advised the halt order to Hitler. Still, in his memoirs written after the war, he wrote that Hitler's failure to order a full-scale attack on the troops on Dunkirk was the first fatal mistake of the war. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. To learn more about the true story of Dunkirk, there's a ton of great resources out there, but I would recommend starting with an amazing book by Walter Lord called The Miracle of Dunkirk, The True Story of Operation Dynamo. Oh, and don't forget, you can listen to the actual speeches from Winston Churchill online too. 
I'll make sure to put links to Walter's book, Winston Churchill's speeches, and plenty more resources over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the answer to the two truths and a lie game, here's a great review from username GracieJoy580 entitled, Great Podcast, Listen Up. Quote, I frequently listen to podcasts on the way to and from work and really enjoy the base on a true story. I've listened to a lot of them and can say they have all held my interest and have taken pleasure in each one. When I hear a story whose movie I haven't seen, it really lures me in to wanting to watch that movie. Some of them are hard to track down. If it's a movie that I've already seen, I find it fascinating to learn what was the truth and what was Hollywood's take on the events. Sometimes I want to go back and rewatch the movie now that I know what really happened. Great podcast. Thanks so much, Dan. Appreciate all the work you do behind the scenes to entertain and inform us. Keep up the good work. End quote. Wow. You know, I actually think I might know who this person is, and they are someone very near and dear to me. But I won't share their name publicly since they've chosen not to include it in the review. I just want to say thank you for all of your support. And yeah, you're right. Some movies are hard to track down. Some of the resources that I use, if it helps, I use obviously Netflix and Hulu, but also movie channel subscriptions, Stars, HBO, Showtime, they swap movies in and out. So keep an eye on the movies that come in and out there. Uh, But also I'll either purchase movies from the Google Play Store or uh, if you have Amazon Prime, you can actually rent movies. Or even if you don't have Prime, you can rent movies. If you have Prime, a lot of times movies are on there for free or You can just rent them as opposed to actually purchasing them, which ends up saving a few bucks here and there. But thank you so much for your support. And thank you, dear listener, for taking the time to find and listen to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you want to leave a review for me to read in a future episode, hop on over to Apple Podcasts. Or if you're not an Apple person, you don't actually have to use Apple Podcasts or iTunes to leave a review. You can also leave a review for the show on the Based on a True Story Facebook page over at facebook.com slash based on a true story. Finally, it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. Here are the two truths and one lie, just as a refresher. Number one, Allied commanders didn't think they'd be able to get more than 50,000 people evacuated. Number two, with Allied troops surrounded, Hitler ordered a halt on the Panzer Group's advance. Number three, the evacuation at Dunkirk was only possible because of a massive Allied counteroffensive that pushed the Germans back through France. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number three. Even though one of the theories for Hitler's halt order was because of a potential counteroffensive, that actually never happened in World War II like it did in World War I. In fact, the Germans continued their conquest of France, and on June 22nd, 1940, just 18 days after the final troops were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk, France surrendered to Germany. Thanks again for listening. Now that you know the true story behind Dunkirk, I'm really curious to hear what you think about the historical accuracy of the movie. How did it do? Let me know in the Base on a True Story Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Base on a True Story podcast. Oh, and don't forget, you can follow the show on Instagram at Base on a True Story podcast. And over there, I like to post photos of some of the faces and places behind each episode of the podcast. Or if you've got questions you'd like to hear me answer on the show, you can find me directly on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B, or you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at based on a true story podcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>